Within the last year or so, these iceberg images have become a popular format for information regarding interesting topics, mostly on the conspiratorial side. The idea behind it is the same as the idiom of the tip of the iceberg, which is referring to introductory ideas that are more easily found compared to the darker, more obscured information hiding beneath the ocean. As icebergs are known for only having about 10% of their entire mass above the ocean's surface. The actual history of when this became a big hot ticket item is hard to pin because it's just that part of etymology that wasn't really documented well. As most idioms and metaphors don't really have a set start, they just gain popularity over a certain amount of time and then become infamous phrases. However, it's likely that this incarnation of the iceberg began on or around May 31st, 2011, when this image of the internet more or less was posted, summarizing the tip as the common man's website, with the deeper parts being about some of the more obscure and hard to access websites, such as the hidden wiki, which is only accessible through the Tor browser. Anyways. These iceberg tier lists have become a well-liked way of documenting, introducing, and showcasing information about a topic to a wide variety of people. And today, I'm feeling a bit nostalgic, so I'd like to discuss the Video Game Conspiracy Theories Iceberg. I understand that this video will be very long, so I've provided timestamps for each section in the description, so don't feel obligated to watch this in one sitting. In Super Mario 64, there's an area behind Peach's castle that you can access which contains a star statue with a plaque on it. Albeit hard to read, some believe it to say, El is real 2401, and as a result, many people have been led to believe that Luigi is part of the game in some form. And through the years, there's been methods and rumors popping up for ways to unlock Luigi in the game, such as collecting all 2,672 coins in the game including the ones trapped within the level on Tiny Huge Island and Snowman's Land. For the longest time, this was believed to be a hoax, until March of 2020 when a massive SNES and N64 beta leak occurred, revealing a lot of beta and pre-release work done on several SNES and N64 titles, such as Super Mario World, Super Mario 64, and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. In this leak was revealed a scrapped multiplayer mode for Super Mario 64, most likely utilizing the 64 disk drive. The second player, of course, would be played by Luigi. Soon after this was found out, the model for Luigi was found, rebuilt, and showcased in-game. Interestingly, the statue was in a weird way correct, as it was 24 years and one month since the release of Super Mario 64 before Luigi would be found in the game. GTA San Andreas was an interesting game since its release. Due to its controversial hot coffee mod, which re-enabled a crudely rendered sex scene minigame that was left over from the beta, this entire segment would be patched out of later releases and would have become an in-joke with later installments of GTA games. I'm getting off track, sorry. Within San Andreas, there's been rumors of several mythical creatures, and due to the vast amount of spooky forests and gloomy areas within San Andreas, Bigfoot has been commonly cited as a creature that lurks within the confines of the map. No one's been able to agree on how this creature acts in-game, as everyone has a different story to tell. Allegedly, there are several in-game references to Bigfoot, especially in Flint County, Whetstone, and most popular of all, Mount Chiliad Natural Arc. In an official interview with Terry Donovan about the topic, he's stated, There is no Bigfoot, just like real life. Which is something someone who knows a Bigfoot would say. Along with Bigfoot, rumors and speculation have appeared about an alleged Mothman-esque creature disturbing the Knights of San Andreas. Being described as a 7 foot tall creature with enormous wings and red eyes in its chest. It's a creature that only appears during the nighttime and especially bad storms in the game. So watch out, you'll never know what lies behind the fog. <laughs> Did I get you? <laughs> In Pokemon Red and Blue, the original Game Boy games, there is an ominous Pokemon found through breaking the game a little bit. This Pokemon is the infamous Missing No. In order to obtain Missing No, the player must first talk to the Viridian City Old Man, the one who teaches you how to use Pokeballs. Entering his tutorial will have the name Old Man, 
saved in place of the player's name until they leave the area, in which case it will be reverted back to its original name. But if you warp, fly, or teleport to a city environment, like Cinnabar Island, the old man name will remain intact. Surfing on the coast of Cinnabar Island will make the game not know which Pokemon to summon, and it will fall back on Missing No. Missing No has many forms, but its most common one is this jumble of pixels, as it's reliant on the placement of letters in the player's name. I don't really know how it works beyond that. Capturing Missing No will cause the sixth item in your inventory slot to be maxed out. This is convenient for rare candies and Master Ball duplication glitches, as those are remarkably rare items. There's been some theories floating around about how Missing No is leftover data of Pokemon that were deleted before release. There are 39 total Missing No in the game. Those along with the 151 Pokemon make up 190, which according to developer Shigeki Morimoto, was the intended number of Pokemon for the games, making it more likely that these are in fact the leftovers from the removed 39 Pokemon. Missing Palace Zone is an unused level in Sonic the Hedgehog 2. It was cut late in development for an unknown reason, but like most cases of late game trims, remnants of this stage are still lingering in the game's code. In the final game, the level is hinted at a lot in the original code. The game's sound files contain a music track titled Number 10, that does not appear anywhere else in the entire game, leading people to believe it's used on this mysterious level. It would later be confirmed through hacking the game and accessing the level using the Game Genie code ACLA-ATD4. This level requires debug mode enabled to be able to play, as without it, collision detection is disabled, making it unable to be played without debugging the level. Head of Sonic Team Yuji Naka mentioned in an interview that Hidden Palace Zone was going to be the place where Sonic gets sent to if he obtains all seven Chaos Emeralds. This would be where he becomes Super Sonic, but the idea was scrapped. The Hell Valley Sky Trees are set dressing in Shiverburn Galaxy from 2010's Super Mario Galaxy 2. They are these amorphic alien-esque creatures that exist in the skybox mountains of the level. Using a camera hack, people have been able to get close to see these creatures. Some of them have long, gangly arms, and others just don't. And these creatures vary in size as well. As to why they're just observing Mario is unknown. These creatures have been theorized to be many things. One theory suggests they're Kodama tree spirits of Japanese folklore that very much resemble the Hell Valley Sky Trees. And some also claim these are skinwalkers, which are commonly reported to be seen in Hell, California. Final Fantasy VII is considered one of, if not the most influential JRPGs of all time, and has what many consider to be a rather emotionally gripping story, with several of the main characters having depressing, tragedy-ridden backstories, and as a result have become hardened, aggressive, or socially distant people. One of these who did not follow that path was the kind, lonely flower girl that Cloud Strife runs into at several points in Midgar. The initial conflict of the game occurs near the end of the first act, which was the most tragic moment of 90s gaming. The Death of Aerith. This scene was tragic due to many players developing a strong connection to her, as she's one of the very first characters you see in the entire game, as a result of strong emotional attachment and desire. Ever since the game's release, rumors revolving around reviving Aerith have been prevalent. The rumor was allegedly started by an employee at Squaresoft, but the company maintains that there's no way to revive Aerith because it would ruin the emotional and dramatic impact of the scene. One of the methods said to revive Aerith was to completely max out the level of an underwater materia, which is practically useless throughout the entire game, but the rumor states that if you max out the underwater materia, then a new underwater area would open up in the Forbidden City where Aerith would be revived. Another method suggests that showing nothing but kindness to Aerith, and nothing but meanness to Tifa during both their dialogue trees, would make it so that instead Tifa would be the unfortunate one at the end of Sephiroth's sword instead of Aerith. The previous two rumors have never been proven to work, but there are non-canonical easter eggs and glitches usable in the game to inadvertently bring Aerith back to life. At the end of Cloud's medial identity crisis, when Cloud returns to the party, going straight back to the church in Midgar allows you to see the ghost of Aerith before she disappears forever. 
This is a one-time event in the game, and apparently, in the area next to the church, there exists a dummy NPC that has this following blurb. I saw her, I really did. This woman just disappeared, right there, around the old church. I waited around, for, but she never came out again. I tell you, it's one of the haunted churches. Which is most likely referring to the ghost of Aerith in the church. In 1995, Microsoft released, along with a new incarnation of their operating system, an Office program package, of which contained Microsoft Excel 95, and that was a secret easter egg. This easter egg would become sort of infamous, as it was something people expected, due to previous developer easter eggs being very common in Microsoft Office software. Previous easter eggs were only kept to specialty credits or motivational messages, but the Hall of Tortured Souls was the former. It was a Doom-like game where you can explore many halls full of names and images of the developers of the software. Easter eggs in subsequent releases were more mini-games. As the follow-up to this package, Office 97 had a hidden flight simulator in Excel, a hidden pinball game in Word, and a magic 8-ball in Microsoft Access. Yummer was a hidden asset discovered in the web game SpongeBob Saves the Day. Found during a dissection of the game's files, people had found a rather disturbing looking character called the Yummer, which existed in the sprite sheet of the inside of the Krusty Krab. Two separate frames of this were discovered. One sprite was just the hands of the creature, while the other also contains the head and neck. The original speculation for this character was that he had something to do with the canned socks that were seen near where he was found on the sprite sheet. People speculated that you would have to bring a sock all the way from SpongeBob's house all the way to Yummer's location in order for the egg to activate. Unfortunately, this was unable to be proven. After a series of emails, the developers of the game finally discussed the hidden creature, in which they said that Yummer was actually a modeling test they did in 2010, and that he had become sort of a meme around the development office. He was used in this game as an easy to spot placeholder for things that they had to fix or change when they went back to edit their work, which is a common thing in game development. It makes sense here, as Yummer doesn't resemble anything else seen in the game, so spotting him was probably the easiest thing, considering we found it almost immediately. Along with this, found in the same search was a sprite set of a destroyed suit of Sandy's. It was also found in the sprite sheet for outside her tree dome. It was planned to be used as a hint for the water helmet to get into her tree dome. There's unused dialogue from Spongebob for when he interacts with the suit. A helmet? It would have been perfect, but it's broken. Nothing useful here. A destroyed version of Sandy's suit with a smashed helmet was probably removed for having some rather dark implications. Yikes. In 1991, Sega released their CD-ROM accessory for the Genesis, called the Sega CD. In 1992, the infamous game called Night Trap released, and caused a big issue about promoting violence in video games. Which is an argument still going on to this day, nearly 30 years later. While the congressional hearings about the subject were going on, Sega released in 1993 a game called Sonic CD, which in of itself never brought any controversy. But it did introduce two new characters, Amy Rose and Metal Sonic. Within the game exists a sound test menu for listening to game music. Using the sound test, players can find a rather ominous easter egg. Inputting 46, 12, and 25 into the sound test menu would bring up this screen. The rows of these human-faced Sonics wagging their fingers is already very unsettling, but the distorted laughter and text that, when translated, would read Infinite Fund, Sega Enterprises, Majin. It was theorized that this screen was for a scrapped anti-piracy message, but there's little evidence to support it. Soon after the release of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, Many fans noticed similarities between the game's soundtrack and some of the songs of Michael Jackson. This led to rumors about the pop sensation working directly on the soundtrack, despite the fact that he is not present anywhere in the credits. In 2005, a former director of Sega's Technical Institute, Roger Hector, did confirm that Michael Jackson did compose a decent portion of the game's music, but he requested to remain uncredited due to not liking the sound of the Genesis. Roger also claims it was due to the child predation charges that were laid against him, but anonymous sources claim that he was contracted to do work on the game long before the accusations came to light. Roger has instead retracted his previous claim, and in 2013 instead claimed any resemblance to Michael Jackson's music is purely coincidental. Based on this guy's track record, I find it hard to believe anything he says on the matter. In 
during the Mario 35th anniversary, Nintendo had begun promoting a port of Super Mario 3D World for the Nintendo Switch. As an added incentive, using Super Mario 3D World as a base, a whole new open-world adventure was announced, titled Bowser's Fury. Rumor began to spread that Bowser's name in the game would be God Slayer Bowser, which would soon be proven untrue as the website for the game soon released after its announcement, along with his name, which was just Fury Bowser. Along with this, in the English part of the world, it was rumored that his name would be Mega Fury Bowser. But again, it was revealed to just be Fury Bowser. The origin of these rumors are still to this day unknown. In early 2015, a video emerged showcasing a new mysterious secret animatronic in the 2014 horror game Five Nights at Freddy's 2. This new animatronic was of the Purple Guy, a primary antagonist in the game's lore. The Purple Guy animatronic only appears before and during the initial phone call. It would appear slumped over akin to Golden Freddy, and in fact it looks like Golden Freddy but with Chica's head and a purple color scheme. The origin of this one seems to be a YouTuber named Roxo1987, in which they've posted two videos about this animatronic, along with several other conspiratorial FNAF videos, such as various jump scares for characters that don't have them, and also just new animatronics such as JJ or Balloon Girl, The Blinking Cupcake, and a grey marionette. Though they've more or less stopped within the last few years due to what I can assume is burnout and honestly a decline in the popularity of the franchise. At the end of the game's first act, the antagonist of the game, Idea, impales Squall with a gigantic ice shard, perceivably killing him. However, when Disc 2 begins, Squall is untouched, which is commented on in-game as well. The Squall is Dead fan blog has spent years, decades in fact, documenting and analyzing all of the evidence that could prove it to be true. A notable piece of evidence is that after Squall gets impaled, the game's story, setting, and enemies take on a more surreal, dreamlike quality that clash with the more realistic setting and world of the first disc. Enemies become more alien and mutated, and every female character who's shown no interest in Squall suddenly becomes infatuated with him. During the endgame movie, several images are shown that heavily revolve around Squall's death in Disc 1. The very last one shows a haunting image of Squall with a large void in the center of his face, implying this to be his final dying dream, with the end of the sequence being the exact moment of death. In late 2017, series dev Toshinori Kit Kitasi? Toshinori Kitasi had done an interview with Kotaku about Final Fantasy VIII, and when asked about Squall and the fan theory, he answered it with, No, that is not true. I think he was actually stabbed around the shoulder, so he's not dead. But that's a very interesting idea, so if we do ever remake 8, I might go along with that story. In The Legend of Zelda, there is a secret moblin that appears in caves around Hyrule. This moblin is a special one, as he is very kind to Link, providing him a handful of rupees. The moblin's quote, It's a secret to everybody is in reference to the fact that the Moblin isn't supposed to stop Link from progressing through the game, and he chooses to help Link, keeping it a secret from the rest of the Moblins. It's a secret to everybody. The phrase has become infamous among Zelda fans, with the phrase existing in some form in almost every game. In Fallout 3, there's a radio station you can listen to called Galaxy News Radio. The host, Three Dog, can be killed and replaced by his assistant, Margaret. Destroying Raven Rock after killing 3Dog will have a chance of gaining a new radio signal. When picked up, you can hear 3Dog, despite the fact that he's dead. This is because Galaxy News has become a numbers station. 3Dog will begin reading a series of single digit numbers, such as 1205528201010, which translates to What are you talking about? You will be missed. In reference to the death of actor Gary Coleman. Users discovered that these messages are predicting future events because of the other messages included. These other messages are Accident in the Gulf, several dead, oil spill apparently averted, in reference to the BP oil spill. 2215, April 15th, 1865. He's dead, and blame will probably be placed on the actor, Booth. Johnson better not cheat me out of the payment. In reference to the assassination of Lincoln. Referencing the past was just a few of the messages that were transmitted, but a lot of messages have dates that were to come. The Queen has died today. The world mourns as, on days like these, we are all Brits. 4-2, March 19th, 2014. 
Have you watched my YouTube video yet? I uploaded myself kicking bums in the nuts. 2416, December 24th, 2012. I can't believe Britney's actually won an Oscar. 2133, February 27th, 2023. There's also one that has no time and date attached to it. <coughs> I can't- I can't believe they've actually done it. Not long left. <laughs> they were warned, but they just had to keep pushing the boundaries of science. <coughs> the noise. I, I can't take the noise anymore. And the light. Uh, dear God, the universe is slowly unraveling around us. I'm not gonna wait for death. <coughs> I have a pistol in the attic. The latest date on any of the messages is 1-27, July 6th, 2027. The Berserk Curse is based upon three deaths in relation to the arcade game between 1981 and 1984. A berserk machine in Friar Tuck's game room in Calumet, Silly, in Calumet City, Illinois, had experienced the deaths of three poor young adult men. Peter Bukowski, Jeff Daly, and Edward Clark Jr. The speculation was that these three men would get a record high score in the game, and then the game's antagonist, Evil Otto, would kill them in some way. Though looking into it would showcase that the story of Jeff Daly has little room to stand on, as it shares almost all of its key information with Peter's story, and Edward Clark Jr.'s story had very little to do with Berserk, other than it being a reason for another customer at the game room to cause issue with Edward for allegedly stealing his quarter. If you want an elaborate discussion on each case, I suggest watching my previous video about it. Keck Croc was supposed to be a video game for the Sega Genesis, released in 1993. Not much is really known about it aside from its very early 90s box art and vague descriptions of the game itself. It's been described as being a very jerky and crude, with the ability to collect Krako dollars, and a location known as Toasty's Castle, and the default weapon of Kekrok is a toilet plunger. All that exists online from the game aside from the box art is this strangely high quality sound clip for a Sega Genesis game. Hey, I'm Kekrok. In the remake of the Spyro the Dragon PlayStation Trilogy, a large red door was added to the introductory world of the first game. It's the only one of its kind, but at no point does the door ever open. No matter what happens, it never opens. However, when charged, the door does shake like something is on the other side holding it shut. Because of this, many people speculate that there was a hidden secret. Glitching through the door reveals that there is nothing but a short hallway behind it. But fans have theorized that the door will be used as an entrance to special DLC levels similar to those featured in the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy. As of now, however, the door has not been opened, nor has it been used for anything since the game's release. Toys for Bob nor Activision have revealed any future plans for the game either. Mr. Mix was an early 90s typing game designed to teach kids how to type on a keyboard. Unlike most typing games, this one is infamous for having a ridiculously hard learning curve. Because of this, level 5 is physically impossible to pass, needing 500 words a minute, which is over twice the amount of the words the fastest person can type, Barbara Blackburn, who can type 212 words a minute. One of the main things that people noticed about the game was the strange background music, as it consisted of little actual music and a lot of unsettling growls and miscellaneous noises like alarms and electric whirring. These background noises would get progressively louder as the game goes on, which would cause serious stress and damage to devices due to not being designed around having loud sounds play through for a prolonged period of time. Mr. Mix himself is rather unsettling, drawn in what appears to be MS Paint with crude proportions. Most children who played the game were reported to have vivid nightmares about Mr. Mix speaking to them in a hushed, gravelly voice, threatening them to keep quiet about something. They weren't able to recall what that secret was supposed to be, but a group of hackers managed to get a ROM of the game, in which they brute forced their way past the impossible fifth level. This group has refused to say what they've found in the final sixth level. However, two years after the incident, a member of the group was found attempting to kidnap a child. He was wearing a white chef's hat and had a look of unspeakable malice and insanity on his face. When interrogated, the man would only say one thing. I am Mr. Mix. 
Luna Game is referring to a series of short platforming games based on the 2010 My Little Pony series. Luna Game has several incarnations to it, with most of them being derivative works of the first one. It consists of very basic platforming, with the player being Princess Luna, a character from the show. Within the first 30 seconds of playing the game, it will crash and cut to an image of either a Zalgofied Pinkie Pie, or just an unnerving image of Apple Bloom. When the game crashes, it floods the user's hard drive with the final crash image, labeling The End Is Nay, a play on the phrase The End Is Nigh. Upon release, it was perceived to be a malicious computer virus disguised as a harmless pony game, but it would later be confirmed to just be a very mean prank. A write-up from the original creator mentions wanting to use later installments of the games to elaborate and expand on their abilities with Game Maker Studio. The Madden Curse is a rather ominous curse relating to the player on the cover of a Madden game, and how the player performs in that season. Marshall Falk, Peyton Hillis, and Vince Young have all suffered injuries in their season that they were featured on the cover. It's been compared to the similar Sports Illustrated Jinx. In 2016, Rob Gornowski battled a hamstring injury for the first four weeks of the season. Things only got worse during the season with a knee injury and being placed on IR to end his season. Despite this, he still helped the Patriots win the Super Bowl, making him the first athlete on a Madden cover to win the Super Bowl. A counterexample to this would be that Patrick Mahomes injured his back during Week 7 to Week 10 of the 2020 season, but he had a really good season throwing 26 touchdowns and guided the Chiefs to the 54th Super Bowl. Looking at a list of it, however, it's six that have been negatively affected to four unaffected, which means that it's more or less a negative effect to those featured on the covers. In World of Warcraft, just beyond the walls of Karazhan, there's a hidden room called the Forgotten Crypt, the entrance of which is blocked by a large gate, which can be passed through through the use of glitches. Within the dungeon of the Forgotten Crypt, there is a large body of water, inside of which contains several groups of human bodies with missing hands, eyes, and have been chained upside down. Traversing the level feels very ominous, as its only inhabitants are the chained sinners. The area feels empty and lived in as a result. Along with the murky water, it exemplifies the age of the place. The Monkey Tribe are a strange species of ape-like characters who appear throughout the level Sierra 117 in Halo 3. The first known location is soon after the character, Sergeant Major Johnson, reports that his vehicle's been shot down. Going left and climbing across a few large rocks leads you to a set of four monkeys, one of them holding a teddy bear. The second monkey spot can be seen when you rescue Sergeant Major Johnson. Using the binoculars, you can see a lone monkey on a small cliff, and the third monkey can be found near a crooked tree, rendering it as a silhouette. The legend states that within certain copies of early Game Boy games, like Pokemon Yellow, Link's Awakening, Atelier Marie, and Spud's Adventure, is a secret game accessed through inputting a specific set of glitches. The game consists of several rooms filled with puzzles of varying difficulty, and an entity that would mess with the player psychologically and emotionally, bringing quote-unquote misfortune upon the player if they were to fail the game. Players who failed seem to have feelings of depression, suicidal thoughts, and even physically sick in certain situations. The game had a very ominous game over screen, consisting of the entity pointing directly to the player with a text box that reads, I am God here. In the North American release of Persona 4, an ominous blinking eye can appear on the Persona screen for certain characters. No one knows why or how this will appear. The most common instance of the eye appearing is on Yosuke's Susan O Persona. The eye doesn't seem to add any additional effects, but just seems to be there. The eye typically first appears after Yosuke's social link is maxed out, but that doesn't inherently mean the players will see it. Others said it was triggered by maxing out the character's social link on their canonical birthday, but the bug doesn't exist in the Japanese or PlayStation Portable version of the game, so this is very unlikely. Within the game files, the eye is tagged as Awakening and Awakening-I, suggesting that the eye was likely used for the Persona's Awakened second form, but there's no evidence to support this. An anonymous person who claimed to have direct experience with the game's development came out and said the eye was in fact a bug and not properly removed from the non-Japanese versions of the games. As far as I can tell, the bug has been removed in the 2020 PC release of the game.
After Animal Crossing's 2001 GameCube release, rumor and tale began to spread around about an evil villager that would move into your house if you don't check up on the game for a long time. This character was a purple bulldog with a black bee shirt and glowing red eyes. Upon moving into your village, Brutus would speak in binary and crash the game when the player enters his or her house. It's very believable due to Animal Crossing already having a rather ominous string of unsettling easter eggs. In the original Animal Crossing, if you go to another player's village and then reset the GameCube, when the game gets started up again, the player will lose everything in their inventory and have their character's face with that of a gyroid, an item used in the game to save. It was implemented as a way to remind the player to save their game, as it will remain until the player saves. And in Animal Crossing New Horizons, if you watch the television at 3.33 a.m., an alien transmission will break through. Kill Switch is a game very much like Polybius, where its existence has been highly reported on, but very little have actually played the game. In this game, you play as Porto or Gast, the former being a young girl who could change size, and the latter character, Gast, is an unlikely pick by players due to Gast being invisible and therefore harder to play. The game was supposedly developed by the Carvina Corporation, and the game only sold about 5,000 copies. According to the legend, the game was unique in the fact that it could only ever be played once. Upon completion of the game, it deletes itself. To find any usable copy these days is near impossible, but a copy was sold at a Japanese auction in 2005 for $733,000 to Yamamoto Ryuchi of Tokyo. Yamamoto intended to make his playthrough of the game available to the public through a YouTube playthrough of the game. But when time came, all that was posted was a 105 second clip of a haggard Yamamoto at his computer, with the avatar selection screen above his right shoulder. Yamamoto is crying. Turns out, the game wasn't real. Instead, it originated as a short story published in The Melancholy of Mecha Girl by Catherine M. Valenti. However, it did spawn several fan games. Much like the aforementioned Artisan's Gate in Spyro Reignited, there exists an internally locked door within the Ordon village in The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. The kind ranch owner, Fado, has the front door to his house eternally locked. As a result, many people have speculated that behind the door is a super valuable item, or a great many rupees. Using the Super Claw Shot, an item obtained later in the game, you can actually clip through the door to get inside, much to the disturbance of Fado. Inside is only an empty black box. This is because according to Eiji Anuma, the door is locked because they didn't have enough time to finish the inside of the house, and so it was easier to keep the door locked. In the very first Pokemon games, Mr. Psychic gives the player TM29, which is the Psychic ability. He serves no other purpose in the games. Because of this lack of character, people began to speculate that Mr. Psychic had something to do with the elusive Poke Gods. The main rumor was that if brought Moltres, Articuno, and Zapdos, the three legendaries of Gen 1, he would tell the player of the Poke Gods. Some rumors would make this more difficult, stating that the player must have obtained all 150 Pokemon, or that they needed three Geodude in their party. This myth has been largely debunked due to a lack of any evidence suggesting it to be true. In the Legend of Zelda series, there are several error characters because they're associated with perceived bugs and or glitches within the games. To promote the upcoming Zelda title on the Super NES, Nintendo Power held a contest where the contestant had to snap a picture of the rare boss fight of Warmech in Final Fantasy. The winner would be one Chris Houlihan, whose room in the released game reads, My name is Chris Houlihan. The room also contained 225 rupees for the player to collect. The game will send Link to this room if the game fails to detect his Y coordinate between rooms. In ports of the game, the room is disabled but still exists within the code. In Zelda 2 The Adventures of Link, there is a lumberjack character that tells Link, I am error. It was assumed that this was a placeholder for when the game couldn't load a text file, but in fact, I am error is the correct English translation of Ore no nawa era de proven by the fact that a later NPC tells Link to ask Error of Ruto about the palace, which will let Error tell Link about the palace in question. The reason it was thought to be believed to be a mistranslation is due to several NES games at the time containing misspellings of their English versions, such as the infamous All Your Base Are Belong To Us in Zero Wing and A Winner Is You in Pro Wrestling. Nowadays, I Am Error is used as homage to the legendary character during moments of technical difficulties with Nintendo websites and presentations. I Am Error would also be referenced in Super Paper Mario, The Binding of Isaac, and Splatoon 2. Error Houlihan is a debug character featured in Cadence of Hyrule, 
a spin-off of Crypt of the Necrodancer. He is found in a house outside of the Kingdom of Hyrule. If spoken to, he will say, I am Error. Talk to him again and he will call himself Error Houlihan, a homage to Error of Ruto and Chris Houlihan. Later updates would patch this out of the game. In World 5-1 of Paper Mario Sticker Star, there exists a pile of trash. In it are notes, usually business notes about the endeavors of the Shy Guys, but there is one note that has perplexed players since the game's 2012 release. The note reads, XD3R B8HH 9ZR2 FL16. The purpose of this code has been left up for debate as people have tried to enter it into Club Nintendo, as well as the Nintendo eShop on all consoles but all that got them was a wrong code message, instead of a code has already been redeemed, in case it was already redeemed. Nearly a decade later and the code has still not been figured out. It was probably a gotcha put in by the developers to mess with the players. During the development of NBA Jam 93, the infamous player Drazen Petrovic passed in a traffic accident, which was tragic due to him being in the game on the Nets team as a valuable player. A person named Mark, according to a story on BallIsLife.com, who is on the team making the game, was in a building with several coin-up machines playing Mortal Kombat when the NBA Jam machine just started chanting, Petrovic. This had only happened after he had passed away too, strangely enough. Even to this day, certain machines will still chant his name. Spooky. According to one story, one Quake 3 Arena player had left a server full of computer-controlled robot players for four years just to see what they'd do. Turns out, the bots had figured out a way to peacefully live without conflict. Apparently, this was the direct result of the programming of AI, as the bots were programmed to adapt to the player's skill, and if the computers were to infinitely become better than their cohorts, at some point logically they would come to a point of equal skill, resulting in them trying to find the weakest link, which would be impossible, as they'd all have the same skill ability. When he interfered and killed one of the bots, the others went for weapons, killed OP, and crashed the server. Unfortunately, no other attempts at this have come out, nor have any tried to. As well, the rumor was corroborated by Matt Murray, a digital strategist at Delete. So, he'd know a thing or two about promoting something online. So whether this is true or not, I really can't say. Smash Bros. Melee is one of the most highly regarded Smash games due to its strange mechanics for competitive gameplay. However, there's a system in the game based off the Pokemon franchise, as one of the items that spawns is a Pokeball which can be used to spawn one of 29 Pokemon in the game. One of the Pokemon is Goldeen, a rather unremarkable Pokemon in Smash, but in its own game it has a very useful move, Horn Drill. The description for Goldeen's trophy in Melee reads, Goldeen's Horn Drill is so strong that it can KO an enemy with one strike if it connects, which for a Smash game would make the use of the Pokeball a high level play option, as the chance for a Goldeen for a free stock is worth it to many players. But alas, in Smash, Goldeen doesn't use Horn Drill but instead the much less useful Splash Attack, which doesn't do anything, making Goldeen one of the few dud Pokemons that serve no purpose than to have some risk to the Pokeball system. Hey, by the way, the background footage I've been using for this is me playing Smash Ultimate. Tell me how bad I am in the comments. The 2019 release of Yeek, I mean Y2K, forgive me, has left a strange mark as the game is quite controversial for the things it's done. I'm not going to get into those things today, because there's a bunch of videos dissecting and discussing Y2K out already. Instead, I'll be talking about the various endings of the game, and one of them that's been left intentionally vague. The first one is the default one that most will get through playing the game and following the story. Then there's one you get if you go to the Korean News Network instead of the New Year's Eve party at the end of the game. AK Studios have teased a little about how to potentially get the ending, but all it was was, It is not in the KMN building. Just look towards the tower on the map. This could mean it's either the large lighthouse near Flagtown, the radio tower near Frankton, or the factory tower that we find Semi in. People speculate that part of the ocean that you can drive into has something to do with it, and also that the code protected chest in Semi's area can be opened to help get this. But seeing as you can only go to that area before Semi's disappearance, it's hard to say. Fortunately for us, Y2K is still being updated to this day, and hopefully they'll include more hints within the game to get this third ending. Until then, it shall remain a mystery. <sighs> oh, I love fucking doing stupid shit. Oh, I think it's great. I love doing stupid shit. Hey, thanks for watching. I know this was a very long video and most of you probably didn't sit through all of it at once, but if you did, I humbly thank you. 
Also, I know I don't do these post-video chats all that often, but this one felt obligated due to the fact that it's been over a year since I posted last to this channel. There wasn't any real reason that I didn't post to this channel, it was just I lacked the motivation to make anything for it. Doing bread plays is incredibly fucking easy. I wish I was joking. If you couldn't tell, I got sick around the time of recording level 2, and then I got better by the time that I got around to recording level 6. It wasn't anything serious, I was just under the weather due to the seasons changing. It's something that happens to me every year, it's fine. Now that I'm nearing the end of the creation of this video, I'm doing a lot better now and I'm a lot healthier. Also, I have been working on videos, I promise you that. There are more videos to come, this isn't just a one-off that I'm making at the start of the year. I didn't quit this channel just to work on bread plays exclusively, I really don't like the idea of that. I really don't like the idea of putting all my creative effort into a channel like that, it's not really my thing. In other news, during the creation of this video and several others, I played through the entirety of Y2K, a postmodern RPG. Twice! It's not a great game per se, but I can see the clear potential. When Y2K is good, it's really good, but when Y2K is bad, it's really bad. And it just so happens that Y2K is bad a lot. I also watched through the entirety of the first season of Pokemon, I watched the entirety of The Office US, and the entirety of Family Guy. I'm not proud of these choices, but, you know, I own up to them. Anyways. More videos to come. Thank you all for waiting so patiently. I very much appreciate it. I'll see you guys around. Bye. See ya.